Okay. Unfortunately, I need to join the meeting through my computer. I was only on my mobile and sorry, my, my apologies. So it's connecting. And do I need to make to do anything else or no 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 unfortunately no. <laughs> unfortunately no it's on my end it's just not connecting uh, okay I think that is going now okay I, I need to leave this the session that I have on the mobile uh, we'll speak soon okay then I will I will give you the the, the right to use the the screen again. Okay, can you guys hear me all right? Yes, we hear you, but we don't see the screen. Uh, well, I just switched to the computer. So, again, should I give you the right to make co-host again? I don't, don't think so. Yeah, I can share screen. You can? Because I don't... Uh, no, 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 you need to give me again, sorry. Okay, I did. Okay, perfect. Uh, I will share screen now. Does it work or not? Mm, should be working now. Can, can you guys see this? No. Weird. Let me try it again. Uh, with this share yes, can you yes, can yes, you see yes, it, it oh, okay sorry my my apologies for okay. the okay i'm going to just put on a big window and let's start so let, let's talk about sotomoto his birthday was on the 25th of July. Unfortunately, we couldn't do the presentation that day. But David, David, sorry for interrupting. Could you please yes. repeat again the, the pronunciation so we get it? Uh, uh, so the pronunciation, the full name would be Eduardo Sotmor. Sotmor? Yeah, it, it's a little bit uh, close, the, the U and, and the... The O and the U uh, in Portuguese, but it's fine if you no, say. No, no, no. For me, I don't, no, David. No, it's important. I try to learn the correct pronunciation. So it's, it's Eduardo Sutmore. Eduardo Sotudemora. Sotudemora. Okay, I'll try. Okay, thank you. It's fine. No, no worries about that. So uh, I put a massive collection of his works since uh, uh, I had time to to prepare the presentation and I end up. Um, Today, when I was doing the PDF, losing a, a bit of them. So unfortunately, the, the collection got reduced, but not that much. It was just a matter of uh, pictures, but not uh, exactly projects. I'm going to start for some of his earlier works that, uh, that you're, you, you're going to see soon enough. But before that, uh, I'm just going to do a very short presentation about him. So, so tomorrow, uh, sim uh, in similarity with Caesar, he is also um, a Portuguese architect from the what we call um, Porto School, uh, at least in, in Portugal. Well, and um, he is slightly, almost uh, twenty years younger, around twenty years, twenty something years younger than Caesar, and he actually starts uh, working uh, at Caesar uh, Caesar's um, studio with him around the 80s and uh, short afterwards he started to get commissions and uh, basically if not the first one one of the first uh, jobs that he ever has been commissioned it was a, a house in Alcacena a region in more or less the south of Portugal which is quite unusual because uh, at, at least at that time uh, in the 90s people from the north will get more commissions in the north and people from the south will get more commissions in the south anyways it's not exactly a, a rule it's just it's curious that he, he managed to get a, a project for a house there david david sorry that i yes. interrupt you again i am just a technician here could you please remove your mouse from a i want to create a, uh, okay sorry okay. sorry about that no no i want to make a good recording thank you 
Okay, my, my apologies. So carry on. Um, you, you can see in this uh, this house that, that he built in Alcacenos that is um, quite visible the influences of Caesar in the materiality. Uh, maybe I'm doing something, some comment that is completely wrong, but at least it's my viewing of, of this project. And as long as you keep watching uh, this presentation, you're going to see that uh, not only this project, but several other ones also have the influences of Mies van der Rohe, at least in the earlier stages of his work, uh, mainly on the organization of, of the plan. And if you focus on the uh, Barcelona Pavilion, you can see that uh, that um, horizontal way of doing architecture, although the Barcelona Pavilion from Mies, it's a pavilion, it's not exactly meant to be dual, it's just uh, some sample of um, exhibition. Uh, this is a house that is completely believable, but you can see some uh, some of lines of influence on that. Of course, you also can see some influences from uh, Portuguese architecture right away. Not not only the horizontal, horizontality of it, because it's very common for the Portuguese uh, agriculture, uh, sorry, <laughs> architecture to be completely uh, grounded most of the times and not exactly built in, um, in several stories or high, uh, high level. Also the materiality, you can see the white that is very common in Portuguese architecture, mainly in the south because of the, of the sun. It's not, so, it's not exactly a need or a wish most of the times of providing and uh, designing white cubes, but also it's more a sustainable traditional way of keeping away the heat and that um, it's one of the main reasons of it. Also you can see here the, the floor, the, the materials that he used on the ground are for, from, um, from a, a traditional way of, um, of Portuguese people to, to build roads and um, sidewalks with the with the stone pavement, quite irregular, but then uh, all together it gets a quite a, a, a homogeneous um, surface. Also, another thing that he you can see on this architecture here it is the, the plan that I, I said that you clearly can see the influences of Mies van der Rohe. On, on the plan, quite functional, and he tries to to free up most of the of the space when possible. Of course, if you have rooms and so on, you need to compartmentalize somehow. But you can see that um, that influence. Also, if you think about some works of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, you can also see some, some something there. And again, the horizontally of the project it's there. My apologies, uh, it's, it's more difficult to find the more photos of the earlier works rather than the, the late, later ones. So this is, it was once also another house that he got commissioned in the south of Portugal, again, he probably had family or good connections in the south of Portugal, I, I don't know, because his, uh, his first work in, in south of Portugal was quite late in his career, but Sotomora was straight from the beginning. So that, that this one is from 94, is in Cascais, and again, you can see that uh, horizontally that I was speaking about. And as you, as you can see, you, you can see some, some influences uh, from Mies van der Rohe, who, who knows even Philip Johnson, maybe. I don't know, I hope not. Um, but uh, you, you can see that, um, that connection with, uh, with, the, with the Portuguese landscape, where, with areas that are more flat. And the only upstanding um, spots that you have from the ground are the trees most of the times. He, you can see that he, he tried to mimicate the that value of the ground on, on his projects. 
and always uh, with windows or openings uh, looking to, towards the landscape. And again, a very functional plan with a quite a regular program uh, regarding to uh, residential projects. But it's very interesting uh, to see that it's well organized and quite um, well rationalized the uses of resources in space. Another thing is that is also very common in the in the Portuguese architecture, and the, that is something that you can also see in Caesars and other architecture ar architects. But is the use of um, stone, as you can see here on the ground, and I'm going to move a little bit back. You can see here. So on the ground level, you always have the use of stone or uh, more harsh ma materials and more resistant materials, though um, conditions of the weather and to protect from the, the humidity level, um, uh, atmospheric humidity levels, uh, and so on. Of course, this is a concrete house and the concrete itself will be quite uh, easy to, to mix with the, the environment, but by itself will not work and will not solve uh, problems of um, water infil infiltrations and so on. So you will need to add other materials to compensate the, the use of only concrete. So this is um, another earlier work that he, he made in collaboration with another Portuguese architect that is Humberto Vieira. And this is a, um, it's a, a um, refurbishment slash um, rehabilitation of, um, of a convent um, in the north of Portugal. Here, he, 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 they basically did a, a rehabilitation of most of the, uh, of the convent and some of, of, of <clears throat> some parts of it, they introduce new elements like um, flooring doors and so on, in order to convert it to um, a hospitality project. So this is um, it, it's not exactly luxurious, but it's something that is something in in between between a two star and a four star hotel. So here, the uh, Sotomora and uh, Umberto Vieira they try to respect uh, to the maximum the, the original language of the of the convent, but the convent was not in use as a convent for several and several years, most likely since the implementation of the Republic in, in the beginning of the 20th century, 20th century, or even be, from before that period. And although it was a very robust building, as you can see here, uh, completely built out of stone and so on, from inside for sure was not exactly in a good condition and they did the research on it. Another aspect that I, I will point out here, again, this is in the north of Portugal. So although you can see that the facade is quite um, white, regarding the, the, the stone um, color used. You don't have that much white as a, a plaster rendered uh, wall on the outside. On the inside, you still have that. That is also another uh, common characteristic of uh, Portuguese architecture. But on the outside, you have mainly stone, at least on these um, historic buildings. Here's some plans, as you can see, sorry. As you can see, they did some new intervention to it, mostly technical areas, kitchens, services areas for the for the convent, and then the convent itself. It was used more for rooms, auditoriums, and other accommodation services for the for for the this hospitality project. The, the project originally it's from the um, um, I would say Baroque P 
period, more or less. It's, uh, Baroque period is, uh, in Portugal doesn't really match up with the Baroque period in, in Italy, but if you have to put one uh, architectural style on it, it would be that one. Some details of this presence on the projects. Another view from the one of the courtyards that also was restored. That's it. So this house here, it's very curious because um, if you look from afar, you basically cannot see the house. The house is quite concealed within the landscape that was pretty existing. And if you see from the top, from the from the street. On, on the upper level, you cannot see the house. Only when you go to the border of the, of the street and you look down, you can see that oh, there is an entrance there, uh, some kind of stairway uh, that will lead to the house. And as you can see, there was a already kind of um, platform that he, um, you just extended to, to do the house. Because these walls here were already there, mo uh, most of them. So it, it got extended to some parts of it here and there, but the rest was kind, kind of already there. And this is a very interesting relation because the, um, to protect the, the facades and so on from a, a sol um, solar entrance, he, use the, the landscape itself as a, a natural protective element of the building and also as a almost poetic uh, element on the design of the house. So you will have a stone corridor on the outside and on the inside you have the corridor for several divisions of the house. So the house is like the latest platform of the terrain that was already built within platforms. This is uh, used normally in this region of, of the country for vineyards, but although you, you can uh, cultivate other, 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 other plants there, but it's mainly for vineyards for, for later on for wine production. So as you can see, there is already these steps in the ground and they used the last one. It's not built, it's almost per completed to, to be the last step that was the house. And it's very simple, the house. It's uh, resumed to a corridor that has on one side the, the rooms and the other side has the landscape itself. And that's it. The house is just the final step on the, on the terrain. So this project here is basically um, inception within the core of a, a spiral parking uh, parking lot. So the parking lot, I'm going just fast forward and then go back. So this is the parking lot, access the ramp. And this was a massive ramp that was uh, quite uh, um, polemic at the time on this uh, wonderful um, postmodern building that I, I don't really know why it exists. But this was a, a spiral a ramp to serve the, the parking lot that, that is part of this shopping center. And the core was just empty. So basically the owner of the, of the shopping center, Commission um, Sotomora, to do an exhibition center, a small exhibition area on the core of the, of the ramp. And this is the look from inside. It's very simple, but at least has some kind of function and utility besides being a completely hollow space that didn't have any kind of use or purpose besides being the core structure of a parking lot. As you can see here, you still have the capacity for a small auditorium and then exhibition space underneath. 
sorry, the, the other way around, uh, on the top you have the exhibition space and the, uh, on the lower part you have the auditorium. This is a housing project that he built in Maya. That is a, a city that um, is near the metropolitan area of Porto, in the north of Portugal. This is from 2001. And if you look from, from, um, from outside, it looks mainly as a storehouse unit. It's quite different from the language that you would have expected from a lot of Portuguese architects. And it's quite interesting the the playful aspect of the facade because although if all the shutters are closed you just see a huge metal box that looks like a container or a storage unit but actually every single uh, lo uh, roller blind corresponds to openings to to the inside of the spaces so inside you have a more warmer feeling although okay you have white walls and so on but as i said that that is a very common element on portuguese architecture because the portuguese architecture traditionally is supposed to be something that is almost free of any decoration and the decoration itself is given by the people that do all the space almost any piece of architecture is like that but a lot of countries uh, have the the use at least from the i don't know somewhere from Middle Ages until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to put wallpaper or to paint the walls with some kind of color. Traditionally, uh, we tend to use either pastel colors or completely white uh, walls uh, on inside. And of course, the timber flooring is something that uh, is also always present if it is possible. And at least, out of curiosity, at least until late 70s, even social housing or even 80s will have uh, til timber flooring because it was, it was not exactly considered a very expensive material and it's always something that um, people in Portugal quite, uh, quite value as a, a warmth to the place. And it's, it's something that you can be be, be using for, for summer and for winter with the uh, opposite um, intentions, one for cooling, another one for, for, for warming. Again, a very regular and rational plan, but will serve the purpose here of the social housing. And as I said, uh, the metal box, as soon as the, the shut and the roll of lights start to be open, here and there will create a, a more playful facade. Some more technical details about the facade, where there is you no know, openings and where there are openings. This here, I would say that is my favorite project of uh, Sotmora. This is not far from uh, my city, uh, my hometown city in, in Portugal. And it's, um, it's a house in the middle of, of the nature. And this area is uh, highly protected um, by, uh, by UNESCO. And uh, it's quite difficult to build here because one of the, the reasons that you can build here, if there is a plot that, that has some kind of ruins or there is an existing house there, Otherwise, unless it's some kind of special demand for a national interest project of high level interest for the Portuguese economic development or something like that, you cannot build here. So I'm guessing that uh, he got one of these conditions to, to build this. I hope so, because a lot of people try to build there and cannot do it because of that. So I hope that is the reason. Anyways, uh, it's a nice project and it, it's like a small white dot in the middle of the, the landscape, but doesn't seem exactly to disturb that much in the way that was designed. And again, you have a, like the other house in Moledo, 
here in the Serra da Rábida, you have a house that you enter from the top and go, go down to the house. And although the other house in Moledo was uh, accessed by a corridor, here you have a courtyard that is something very usual in, in, the, in the south of Portugal. And it is a direct influence from either the Roman Empire when he, he was ruling the, the Iberian Peninsula or the Muslim influence when they were also ruling the same place. And this staircase here, uh, when I was putting together the, um, the, the presentation, one thing that, uh, that ca came across is like, oh, this, um, this, uh, this, this staircase, uh, it's an example that Corbusier also did, uh, as uh, uh, Alexander, my partner, pointed out here. And uh, I, I would say that, well, this staircase here, probably if it was a little bit wider, according to Portuguese regulations, we could pass. But I'm almost betting that uh, for this, without an end rail on that side, maybe during the construction, they put a, a temporary end rail there and then they remove it. Or maybe they got some kind of special exemption. But I don't know. Anyways, it's a very nice staircase where it displaces uh, around the courtyard. And if you carry on, you enter the house and you, you have a nice view towards the, the nature and the landscape that surrounds it. And here, although you don't have the timber on the floor, you also have a um, kind of marble stone that uh, is all over the place um, in, all, in all Portugal. So as... Uh, in comparison with Caesar from a, a previous uh, presentation that I did more or less one month ago, he also tries to use a lot of the local material uh, materiality on these projects. But again, you have the same color palette. You have the pastel colors on the stone and you have the white on the walls that with the time uh, will get yellowish, but will get a nice fit with the sun that uh, always is brightening the, the place around. Here the inside is not exactly white white, it was a kind of already a pastel color by inception. But still, uh, the same pastel, pastel colors that goes with the same palette. And you can see that here the the plan it's not exactly as rational as the other ones, and uh, fulfill more a uh, requirement with the landscape of visual elements and articulation with the interior space. And as you can see here on the first one, it's like a continuation of the, this plateau. And here it's kind of a, a blob that follow, try to, tries to follow the, this slight cliff. So this is another house that, where you can see the presence of the local materi materiality. So in the south is more current, the, this kind of marble, but in the, that I, I show in the previous house project, but uh, in the north is more common, the granite uh, kind of stone. And you can see here it is. Although one thing that is always in common, although it's more hilly in the, in the north part of the country, it's the horizontally of the projects when the landscapes are lost. And this one is uh, it's a plot in, in the middle of a small village that belongs to that city of Montezin. But you can see that it's uh, all developed in basically one plot. This is just the detail of the kitchen that you see here. Just a more detail. 
trunk of, of it. So these houses are very interesting because uh, one literally, I would say that follows the landscape, uh, the, the cliff on the landscape, and the other one tries to contradict it. So let's have a look. So as you can see, this one literally follows the landscape. It's a parallel, it, it's like a ex parallel extrusion of the landscape. And the other one says, no, I'm going to contradict it and I'm just going to go straight forward. Almost looks like uh, when you're walking here on this street, here you can see that there is a house there, okay, it's on the lower plateau, but here it's like this one is uh, running away and is going down the cliff. This is interest, interesting tension of, of it, uh, this, this house here. Where you enter from the top and not exactly know what they're expecting on the inside. Maybe it's tilt, maybe it's uh, flat. But this shape allows a very interesting um, approach to the, to the house where you have a shadow that, uh, and light that gets the, the way into it. And then inside, um, you, you can see that you have a different uh, looks of it, at least on the, the one that is the, the complete flat plateau. And unfortunately, I don't have pictures of the other one. So we'll have to imagine through sections. But so here you go. Here you have the lower part of the tilt house, the, the one that is followed the cliff. This is the part of the pool. Then you have the, the upper part. Doesn't look that much irregularity here, although you can see here that. This is the upper part of the house. Oh, sorry, my bad. Okay, all good. Um, you, you can see here that uh, it's quite regular inside. And then on the section, you can see why. Uh, David, could you enlarge a little bit the sections so we can see them better? Uh, I'll try to do it. Just if not, me. it's okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. Well, no, no, to see both at the same time, but a little bit larger, yeah. I'm going to try. Just. Yeah, kind of like this, yes, thank you. So you can see that the, you have a more open space where you enter the house, you have a double, uh, double height flooring. And then here on the other part of the house, since you have a program to, to fit in, you, you have a different a different area. But it, it's it's very interesting because you, you have this slope here and you have the house, and then you have another plateau with with the with the pool. But if you do a section to the to the other on the other direction, you, you see a very regular house. As you can see here, you have, again, you have the double height space where you enter the house, the living room, then you have the bedrooms, services areas with, um, with the bathrooms, and then on the upper part, you have an, another area for, for dining uh, and next with the kitchen. Basically, you have the entrance, you enter on this area, the kitchen, going straight to the living room area. Some details of, of it. And this is the, the, the platform plateau house that is uh, like this bottle of beer, stick it there on, on the ground to a massive piece of structure. The, uh, the, these foundations are a massive piece of concrete structure that is 
attaching the house to, to be standing there. So this is another project that uh, was quite polemical because it didn't have that much use. And uh, I think that so far doesn't have that much use. I, I don't know if it was sold uh, ultimately or not, but it was meant to be a house for cinema in the city of Porto. And the concept behind it was kind of uh, having different perspectives from the windows towards the city as a, let's say, a reverse um, camera that was, um, instead of uh, projecting, was capturing the landscape around it. Basically this. So you, you will, from inside of the house, you will have frames to, towards the outside, which is normally what happens uh, when you have a very nice placed window. And this was the idea as a project, a cinema projector. So this stadium, it's uh, although I normally uh, don't like particular stadiums, um, as um, I would say, as a nice piece of architecture, I, I would say that. Most of them are not exactly aesthetically pleasant. Of, of course, there are a lot of good examples, and I can say other examples. But uh, let, let's say that only, at least regarding my view of uh, as an architect, only around 10% maybe will have some kind of new addition to, towards architecture and in, in engineering. And I think that this is a good example for both, for both architecture and uh, engineering. And this, uh, this stadium was placed on the, inside, on basically inside of a former quarry that was already on the, with a big hole on the ground and on the, on the, the cliff that you see that uh, the photographer was standing when he took the picture. And as you can see here, sorry for the lower resolution picture, but you have a massive choir here. This, uh, this landscape was, it was completely a, sk a sketcher for, for stones. And the idea of the stadium and the possibility of the stadium, because this is a municipal stadium, this was the plot available for it, was to place it uh, as it is as it was built, or as the, on the opposite direction, let's say rotated 90 degrees and where one of the, or one of the stands would stay as a Roman amphitheater that uh, will have the, the public um, watching over the football uh, matches. And here he, you, you can see that he went uh, on the other direction. So he assumed that the choir is there. So there is no point of denying it. it there is no point of uh, fill it with concrete. Uh, it will be even more expensive that uh, will be ready to, to build a, a stadium. So he, he assumed, um, assume it as an um, almost empty space as a, a continuity of the, of the choir, I would say. And here you, again, my apologies for the low resolution picture, but you can see the, the contracts between the new build and the quarry. But at the same time, you can see that there is some kind of um, organicity within the concrete and the quarry next to it. And another other problems that we were going to face it, it was that the stadium by international um, requirements, because this stadium was uh, meant and it was holding some of the matches for the uh, football Euro European of 2004, uh, it was that it had to be covered. So if you are to, to do 
covering on this kind of stadium, like this um, doesn't doesn't have a complete circle to to close the the roof. Uh, you will face a massive uh, water problem regarding the the rain uh, rainwater and so on if it is if it is raining because you don't you will not have um, support all around the stadium to to do it so so one thing that he came out with it was these massive bridges that uh, they they allow to drain the water out of the roof as you can see here. Of course, there are other means of, um, of draining the rainwater out of the roof on this stadium, but these are basically the main, main ones. And again, you can see the proximity of the, the stone that was clearly say, okay, this is one of the, the stands of the, of the stadium. It's going to be the stone that is already there. It's going to be the, this carved mountain that, that was already there. And another thing that is very curious about this um, this uh, stadium is that the the pitch, the football pitch, is com uh, it's completely elevated by a, a concrete structure because that part was already carved uh, in the terrain though though the the quarry that was existing there. So again, on the that concrete st structure, you assume the the locality of the place built around uh, around it, and then on, to support the pitch, he, he projects a massive uh, concrete structure. That it's quite similar to if you are to to remember when work from Frank Lloyd Wright on the John, uh, Johnson Building, uh, those kind of uh, mushrooms uh, columns. You can you can see some connection there. These are some other inside pictures of the, the stands. And then you can see that this grill here, on this side, you will have the, the, the pitch. And below the pitch, you have a massive parking lot that serves all the stadium. And then here, you have the stands. And as you can see, this was a massive quarry all over the place. So this part here still follows part of the landscape and he attached to it the, the concrete on these areas. And then this part is a freestanding, but you also get here this part. Of course, another thing that has to uh, was considered on on the orientation of this stadium was the, the wind, because if he was facing the the other way around was going to have more problems with the wind. And in this way uh, you have basically only one part where the wind is um, it, uh, in this region is always um, uh, less uh, less strong, and all the other parts are covered either naturally or by distance. David, um, sorry to interrupt you, but is it possible to enlarge the images a little bit, zoom them? So it, it is. It is. Uh, I just didn't want to do it. Uh, some of them because they are. They are all old, and uh, the resolution is not that good, so you lose quality. I yeah. most of the times I prefer to have smaller pictures rather than low quality ones. But I appreciate it. it. Thank fine. you. Thank you. Do, do you want me to to go back on any specific one? I can go. I can go back on a, a few ones. Yes, this is very small, yeah. Very small. So, as you can see, it's like a pixel party now. Yes, but, you lose the, the quality, definitely, yes. Yeah, but but again, this grill is all around the, the, the football pitch, and then mm -hmm. below it, you have the parking and other services areas on this part. Below mm -hmm. the sky. Can I ask about the material for the roof above the seating. Uh, is that actually concrete or some kind of uh, other material? Uh, I don't exactly have the, the answer for it, but uh, I think that is mainly metal because... Mainly metal, okay. As you can see here, 
for for the looks of it. And uh, I visited this stadium a long time ago. Uh, I don't remember to to see concrete here. I, I remember to see metal uh, metal sheets on top of it, and all of these uh, are basically uh, sorry metal ropes. Okay, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, basically, so supporting both uh, roof stand uh, roof sorry uh, stand roofs. Hmm. So here you probably can see it better. You have here, this is metal all over the place. The, the oh, yeah. Yeah. And here you have the concrete part. Here, this part is also concrete. This bit here, I'm not sure, but I'm betting that it's also metal for what I remember. And then goes on the those parts there. Anyway, anyways, I, I think that is a remarkable piece of architecture and engineering altogether. And uh, the uh, ambience inside, it's, it's quite, uh, quite, quite nice. And one thing that I like about, although it's not exactly very good to feel it, but one thing that I like about concrete stadiums uh, or complete concrete stadiums, it's that you, if the, the supporters of the, the football teams are jumping, or uh, shouting or something like that, you feel all that um, uh, sh uh, shaking all over the place. You know perfectly that the, the building is going to stand and so on, but you feel it com completely. And that gives a, a difference, a completely different ambience for the football match. So as you can see here, it's, this was what I was saying. Here you have the former quarry, basically all over this place. Here was the bigger, uh, Crete, and this is the the part that is uh, more open, and all the rest is like a U shape protecting the stadium. Some details about some areas of the stadium. Here is the, um, sorry. as you can see, this is uh, beneath the the pitch, so you have the the parking and supporting areas. Then you have the another level for it. <laughs> Get the to the pitch stands. Some sections. The organization of the stairwell is quite nice, mm -hmm. and there there are lifts. No, don't, don't worry. Uh, if you, all of you are thinking that there are only steps to go up, but no, there, there are also lifts. Okay, clearly this was zoom. So this was a work, uh, work of architecture that um, Dan already presented before. It uh, was done together with uh, Alvaro Caesar and Cecil Balmond. Cecil Balmond, and it was on um, Serpent and Pavilion. I'm not going to do that much on this one because it was presented before. Uh, it's kind kind of unusual the, this kind of language uh, from um, from Caesar or uh, Sotmora, but I think it was the conjunction of the three architects that uh, can, the, that came together with this. So besides uh, houses and so on, as you can see on the on the stadium, it, it probably get got uh, the first taste or first big taste on, on um, big infrastructures, or at least uh, I'm thinking about it. And they managed to to get the commission for um, after competition for the um, underground uh, Porto underground. A service. So he got commissioned to, to do several um, sessions, and most of them have basically the same language. And the, I don't know if any of you already went to Porto or know the city, but if you go uh, towards uh, towards uh, any of these stations, you have a very similar language to it, and that was one of the purpose of of the of them 
try, uh, trying to be built at, at the same time was to have a, a continuous language between them. And also the, um, the project selected, um, either if they are from Sotmoto or another ones that were with partnership with CISA, for example, they always have the same kind of language, but quite functional. And you can see that the, the place is quite, um, quite illuminated and white. Also, a lot of uh, stations have um, archaeologic um, remains that were, were taken care of it and were, were assumed as an existing part that can provide some kind of uh, underground museum for the, the people that are using the underground on some of the stations like this one. If I'm not mistaken, yes, this is the Casa de Musica one, and this one, if I'm not mistaken, it's another one. But I'm I'm almost sure that this one is uh, closer to the um, to the main cathedral of uh, of Porto. This one here is the Casa de Musica one. So. Although I was keep telling, uh, so a lot of grounded architecture, horizontal architecture, and then around 2007, there is a tower. Uh, this tower was also built in, in Porto, in, and it's quite unusual to see a tower this big on any Portuguese city. Normally, the highest building of a city in Portugal doesn't go as far as 10 or 12 or 12 floors. First of all, it's not exactly very safe for a lot of localities in Portugal to build in that high uh, st uh, story level because of uh, constant earthquakes, even if they are small, that most of the times are. The greatest one that ever happened uh, in Portugal, or there is a, um, a record of it. It was uh, in the middle of the 18th century, but it basically uh, wiped out uh, all uh, city of Lisbon, or almost all of it. And uh, since then, there is a lot of concerns about seismic construction and all the, co the construction going on around Portugal. So building in height is something that doesn't really come natural to us. But this is a good example of a tower, although it's not exactly, how can I say, it's not exactly something that was uh, brought as a new language or, of it. You, you can see, again, some kind of influence of Misvan on the organization of it and some kind of simplicity on the facades and you can see there is one facade i'm going to try to zoom a little bit again you can see that there is one facade that they have more opens openings that goes towards the this avenue and the other ones are completely shattered almost you have just small openings on, on it first of all it's also because of the the center orientation it's protecting the the, the facades but also, it's kind of an uh, interesting contrast of light, uh, light and shadow on, the, on this tower. This tower is also very tectonic on, the, on their, uh, his design. Because uh, most likely, since it belongs to a, a massive uh, construction, uh, Spanish construction company, or at least it used to belong to, uh, this tower. Uh, I don't know if they are still the owners of the tower. Uh, it, it's quite uh, rational, the, the use of the tower and the, the design of it, but quite thorough the detail of it. These are some details of the, the smaller service, uh, services office that you can see next to the tower. And it's basically office tower, nothing that much besides in the facade. But I think that is the most um, impressive element of, of the project. It's, again, it's quite a functional project, very rational. And let's resume again to to some private housing. So this is another house in the north of Portugal. 
also done, uh, was done in steps. But although the other one in Toledo, if you are recall, it was basically the last step on the almost pre-built uh, landscape that was already in place. This one, although follows the landscape, it is in itself uh, the house built of steps. So there is a slight inclination on the on the on the terrain, but here the most interesting part are the, the steps that the house itself uh, does to it. So you can see here, this is the, the roof plan. You can see here that you have some kind of uh, inclination towards this side, a slope, so the water will fall, uh, fall towards this side. And you can see that the steps are coming from this side, tuck, 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 until we reach the highest, um, highest parts of it. And here it's a good example of, of what I was describing. So you have the slope and then you have extrusions, massive steps that build the house. And c coming from the lower uh, step, that they are at the garage, you can see the second step and the third step. Uh, this one, I'm just going to pass over it, uh, but it was just, uh, I, I put this project because I, I quite like the, the models that were produced for this project. So this was a competition that he did in partnership with some Italian architects, Alberto Izzo and partners and Nicola Di Battista. And it was for a, a station in Bologna. I believe that this project uh, will never pass uh, from a competition level, but I may be mistaken. At least I didn't find uh, found more information about it. So I don't know that much about this project, but as I say, I, I like the spaces that were produced for this kind of uh, program, where you have um, wide and uh, not uh, overwhelmed by a lack of space or headroom of a station and here's some photos that I also found interesting them producing on a workshop for models probably on the studio I don't know uh, on their studio but producing this massive plan this massive model that you can see here And uh, as you can see, the site for the, the station was not small. And for what I was reading this project was extension, actually extension of the present project. Because if you look here, you can see that there is something already there. So there is a station there. The, and then it was going to be an extension of it. Again, I don't recall if this project ever saw the lights of the day. So this is uh, a very interesting project. He basically was one of uh, his, his projects before he, uh, one of his latest projects before he, 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 he won the Prisker Prize. And this is um, a museum, art museum made for um, a Portuguese painter that is Paula Rio. and she is eradicated for years uh, now living uh, in the UK in London but uh, as she says uh, often and often she is Portuguese and uh, that doesn't want to be mistaken by other nationality which, which is interesting because um, um, a lot of uh, Portu uh, Portuguese painters and artists that uh, fled the country during the fascist regime, sometimes they they didn't care that much more about the, the country, but uh, she she stands by, by it. So again, the use of the concrete, this time with a different kind of expression by the, this uh, reddish pigment. Uh, putting in mix some, 
some pigments from uh, ceramic tiles and so on. And all project goes around these two chimneys that are actually not part of the exhibition area as you're going to see it, but as a part of symbolizing that the museum is there and it's kind of a house there. And this, uh, this, uh, in this um, particular project, it's to symbolize that the house is there because the name in Portuguese would be Casa das Histórias, which means um, house of the of the of the of the story tales or story tales house. And uh, this kind of symbol is that uh, you have like two chimneys there that you have a house, and around that you tell a story that is the museum. This was a, a, a empty plot, so there was not, not much uh, around it. These trees were red, already there, most of them, at least the, the bigger ones. And uh, one of the purpose of the project was also to not be ver in a very high contrast with the, with the surroundings. So you can see that this existing wall that was containing the, the plot was already there. And probably this lady is around 150 high. And this uh, um, this gentleman probably around 170 outside, oh 175 maybe, and you always can see towards the the these walls. So if you put a massive building, although this one is quite big already, at least for the surroundings, if you put a one that would be bigger than this one, you you are not going to integrate it that well with the with the surroundings landscape. Another thing that I find very interesting is the since the inside is basically white and the floor is black to the contrast with the walls, you have, because of the sunlight that comes uh, across the windows, a nice um, pinkish reddish shade to the white of the walls that when you don't have uh, paintings uh, and so on. So when you have openings that, that are facing these internal courtyards of the project, you have this kind of nice nuance, nice um, shade uh, of color coming from the walls outside. So you uh, either have the paintings on the blank canvas of the walls, or you have this uh, nice light coming from outside. This is uh, just the auditorium on the on the basement level of the of the museum, and these are the sh the interior of the chimneys that you see outside. In this case, this one is the museum shop, and this the, the museum cafeteria. These uh, pictures are, are probably quite aged because this is one of the exhibitions there. So if you are going to visit this museum now, you can see these full paintings. But uh, on, when these were taken, it was quite empty still. And most of the trees that you are seeing on the outside are now fully grown, so the museum has a different look looks to it. But it's still like, at least to me, although it's a very simplistic and very conceptual form towards the this concrete language, it, it still looks like a fairy tale um, house placed in, in the middle of the of the woods. And here you can see that uh, all the concrete was made uh, in the in situ. And here you, you can see that you still have the imprints of the timber used to do it. So there was no prefab concrete, it was all made in situ. These are the ticket, uh, the ticket venue, and also the dressing look, uh, clock room area. Here you can see already some paintings on the permanent exhibition. And here you can see the relation with the trees on the surrounding.
So this, I believe that was another competition, but again, I put it here because it shows a different kind of language and mentality towards Sotomoro, uh, normal language uh, on the project. And this was a competition for um, uh, Venezia Master. So the question uh, next to, to Venice called Master. And it was a museum that would be an extension of a conference. And uh, I found it interesting because it's like their interpretation of the extension is as a built uh, ruin inside. So this is, uh, again, more uh, underground stations, or metro stations in Porto. These ones were done together with uh, Albert Caesar. And they also show uh, the uh, part of the rehabilitation of uh, the main, one of the main avenues of Porto and also one of the main squares. So this is the upper part of, of the metro station, that is the one of the avenues and uh, the square. And this is the <coughs> the underground station underneath. That you, you can see that as the same uh, look and feel almost of the the other ones that I, I formerly show. So again, going back to linear architecture. This is in the south of Portugal as well, uh, in a region that is uh, Porto uh, Porto Alegre. And this, um, this is in a very flat area of the country and would not make sense to, to go against the landscape, at least uh, in my view. And I, I think that he, he did well on keep it simple. And for this uh, program of uh, hotel and catering school, I believe that uh, a linear language is also quite useful and didactic for people that are learning how to manage uh, hospitality sector and catering sector. I forgot to tell, but this is also a partnership with another architect, Portuguese architect, that is uh, Graça Correia. And here you can see some plans of it. And you can see that there was already an old factory that was also, I, I'm not going to show that project uh, because I already had a long list of projects. So I, this, uh, it, it was a plot basically with four different projects and I choose to put this one that was the new build, the completed new build, and the other parts next to it with the same partnership between Sotmora and Graça Correia was the rehabilitation of these um, <coughs> uh, old uh, warehouses and factories. Uh, uh, transforming them to a um, virtual center uh, multimedia uh, didactic um, facilities. And also another one to, with a more open warehouse that you cannot see here uh, to a parking lot. Well, actually you can see, you can see it here on this section. So again, Although it's quite flat, this area, uh, you can see that um, you have different uh, you have different steps. Just going to pass through. And again, always the visual from the all the openings on the <coughs> on these projects.
So this, again, towers, uh, but in, this time in Barcelona, another place that also it's not quite used, or used to, to towers. And uh, another partnership with Spanish architect, uh, Terradas Arquitectos. And this is the look and feel of the, the facade of the towers. These are basically um, housing complexes. That, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at least part of it, if not the, the total of it, are, uh, so, uh, are social housing. As if you, you, you can see here, this is the old uh, power station of uh, Barcelona. It's, um, central power station. And you can see that this is basically the same height, or if not a little bit taller, uh, of this uh, huge chimneys there. And uh, one interesting part of this project altogether it's although you have three different um, buildings, they are all joined together by the public space. And if you pay uh, close, uh, close attention to it, you can see that all these ground level spaces and this uh, public space here is all on, on the same level. And these canopies here that uh, the this uh, part of the buildings that are balanced towards the outside are all on the same level as well, providing a continuous uh, unity to the public space and the connection between the buildings. There is a section that will explain that better, and it's this one. I'm going to zoom again for you to see. And you can see that this it's a level of unity on the ground level that unifies all the, all the buildings, although they are all separated. And creates interesting routes towards them. This was another competition that he did uh, with uh, in partnership with uh, the Portuguese architect, that is Adriano Pimenta. Uh, this uh, is a uh, competition for um, a train station as well for the um, <coughs> ice train that uh, still didn't arrive to Portugal. We are expecting this for a lot of time now. There is always competitions time to time, but uh, tends to not arrive. And this was a, a competition for it. And the idea behind it is that um, the looks looks and feel of the, of the station would look like a, a massive landmark of Everest a city. That is the Roman aqueduct that, um, if not the biggest one, still completely intact. It's the biggest one outside of uh, Italy. Uh, as a, a completely intact aqueduct from the uh, Roman period. And you can see here that how massive it is. And this is a train station, so that they projected. So basically, this it's almost the same size. And that is not the whole output, it's just the main arches. I put this project here more to show some variety and the interesting relation with the actual language. This is another very interesting project and another um, partnership with some project. This is a project of a crematorium, uh, crematorium in Belgium and follows basically the landscape again. Uh, although there is, well, it's a crematorium, so you will have to have uh, almost obligation uh, chimney somewhere uh, around. But um, if you look to it, it almost looks like a con abstract tree in the middle of the, of the project. So here, it doesn't disturb that chimney. At, at least for me, it doesn't disturb that much the horizontal horizontality of the project. So you have the trees on the backgrounds, you have the 
the line of the building that follows the line of the landscape. And then you have the chimney that is one more tree, a massive concrete tree, but still a tree. And here it almost looks like you cannot see it from the outside. It's quite integrated, so you just have a, a little bit of a, a stand up here as a barrier, physical barrier that then leads you to the to the building. And then on the other part, you have the show building. It's quite well integrated in the landscape. So this is a, um, Miko Torga was a Portuguese writer, a very important uh, Portuguese writer of the 20th century. And this is the cultural space um, dedicated to his, um, his uh, writings and also to, to be a didactic place for, for continuous learning from this region of Portugal that is Sabrosa. So here you have um, a little bit of uh, a different language. Uh, Miguel Torga also was cons considered a little bit of a dark uh, Portuguese uh, uh, author, writer. So um, I don't know if that is, was an analogy that he was looking for by doing the build as a kind of a burn looked uh, timber facade. which is not timber, but still looks like, like it. Although this is basically stone. And you have plenty, and then of course you have some timber elements, but you have plenty of uh, beautiful details going around, and then, then a simplicity of design again. And, and other beautiful horizontal lines to go with the landscape. So this project uh, I visited recently last year. Uh, this project was built with funding. Uh, this may not look like, may look like, it depends on the notion of uh, socialism from each country, but this is essential uh, kind of social housing. This was a uh, housing project uh, built to 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 give shelter and uh, provide a new home for victims from national disasters that ha happens around uh, 2010 2011 in the, these islands in uh, Soros Islands, more uh, specifically on this island, San Miguel, in Portugal. And these are some nice concrete. Uh, well, I said nice. I like the language. Others may not like it. Um, uh, nice concrete um, houses built as uh, as part of of, of the um, this um, uh, um, sorry <coughs> a little bit of water my apologies so as you can see here the all the houses are around it although they are mainly white. Uh, they are not always white, white. And one thing that they have quite in common, it's the pronunciated slopes of the roof. So it's as if you ask for a small child to, to draw a picture of a house, normally they put like a pitch roof with two slopes on a 2D uh, elevation. And it's more or less what you have from these uh, nice looking houses here. And it's not exactly disturbing the, the landscape. It's a beautiful landscape. This is a massive lagoon. Actually, there are two. The second one, you cannot see it from here, but they are basically put together. One is blue and the one is green. This is the blue one. And this area here may not appear, but was not there was no trees here before. This was an uh, area that was uh, occupied by agricultural fields and, and so on. So it was to cultivate plants, vegetables, and so on. And then you have all the trees uh, that surround it. Uh, 
and it serves the purpose. It's nicely built, nicely designed. I will also show some pictures of the inside. It's very simplistic, quite robust, will not uh, have the same problems that the other houses had because they were mainly <clears throat> traditionally built but uh, with a very poor building and didn't survive the landslide, uh, landslides um, that fo fo follow some uh, rainy and st stormy weather. <clears throat> David, uh, someone asked if the roof is also concrete. It's also concrete. Uh, I was trying to read the chat. That's the reason that I, I paused. It. It's just that the only question? Let's see the chat. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, the, the roof is also concrete. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think that I don't have the detailing for this one. But I don't remember if I, I found but all the house, it's basically concrete. No, sorry, my, my apologies. I don't have, I don't have more pictures of it. I, I couldn't find the detailing from it. But you have, uh, basically, you have concrete, uh, you have insulation, and then you have uh, the internal part. As you can see here, more or less, you will have some kind of um, plasterboard on the inside. Of course, uh, there are some kind of details for the roof. You can see here that you have a gutter, so the water will fall and you, through the gutter, and then you will have a downpipe that leads to the to the rain water um, <clears throat> plumbing system. Are these social housing, like subsidized housing or commercial yeah. housing? No, no. This was uh, this. These were founded. So, how can I explain? It's kind of uh, in between this one. So, these were founded by the European Union uh, as uh, a, a mean to give provide housing for people that lost their homes during the um, during the landslides that occurred uh, some years ago in the in the Soros Islands. So a lot of people lost their homes. And uh, not only on this area they, they were built, they were built different projects on different areas. This is, uh, I think this is just one of the examples. So in a, in a way, social housing, because it was the government state, the, the government, the Portuguese state, that with some European funding, in this case, uh, built the houses to provide to, to those people. So. For what I understood, or at least as far as my knowledge goes, they were free for those that were homeless due to uh, the natural disaster. So you can say in a way that this is socializing. Okay, thank you, David. Sorry. So another convent, uh, rehabilitation. This one, he was quite destroyed, the, the convent uh, was quite destroyed. So. This is in the south of Portugal, it's in the region that is Algarve. Uh, that is the name of the region. The name of the city itself is Tavira. And this was also transformed into a hotel. Although this one looks from the outside, I don't have uh, much pictures of this hotel, but you can easily find it online, even on a website like Booking. But the, the pictures were not very famous, let's say, uh, in terms of quality. So I. I just look at the ones from the outside. And the facade outside is quite interesting because he basically kept most of or only the, the openings of the original convent. And of course, there is an extension that doesn't have anything to do with it. It's next to it. But as you can see, there is some kind of language here that although this one is completely plaster rending and so on, and you have the you have the openings here, you can see that there is some kind of, I don't know, rhythm, some kind of um, nice design to this traditionally made, more traditionally made windows, rather than this completely new built and uh, designed by an uh, outdoor architect. 
but although there is some kind of nice trick to it, you can see that the shadow and the light have a perfect execution um, on the on the design. That it's almost a free gift from the the first architect that uh, um, project the, the comments outside. Or uh, when I say architect, it was a convent, so it could be only a guild builder and not, a, uh, not exactly architect. But still, there is a, although they are not exactly follow some kind of rule, a semantic rule and so on, most of the openings are from the existing uh, convent. And they are, I don't know, at least in my view, something. They are nicely placed on the facade. It's not a regular um, drawing of, uh, of openings, but I, I don't know. It's uh, it, it's difficult for me to explain. I, I look at the facade and uh, I see some materiality and light and shadow diversity that uh, makes me like the project. So this project here, uh, it's uh, also one of his recent ones. When I say recent, it's, so it was seven years ago, but uh, well, architecture is a slow process. So sometimes it, it takes years to, to build a project. So in a way, this is recent. And it, was a, it is a multi-purpose pavilion in Vienna do Castel, again, in the north of Portugal. This is almost in the, in the border with Spain. And it's also open to the, to the ocean. So this, uh, this pavilion has a very uh, nice curiosity that is all these um, these uh, services and facilities that normally are inside. They, this one follows the logic of Richard Rogers on the Lloyds, on the Lloyds Bank in London, they are on the, or on the uh, Centre Georges George Pompidou in, in Paris. They all, they all, or most of them are outside, which gives the, the space uh, a notion almost of an industrial building, which I, I think that it was also one of the intents because the building is located on a, on a, um, a city that is basically a, a huge uh, um, shipyard, uh, has a lot of uh, industry regarding um, ships. Uh, regarding uh, uh, fishing, uh, regarding um, uh, portuary activities. So in a way, it's a reminder of that industry of, of the city. And then inside, you just have completely flat surfaces that are basically free from all the services uh, that you you have MEP services and so on that you have passing on the exterior and are limited to the bare essentials on the interior. Do you know when this was completed? 2013. Okay, so it's fairly recent. Yeah, seven seven years ago, more or less. Mm, very nice. Those holes that you see on the risers, I expect, is where some of the air conditioning air is either coming out or going, yes. going away. Uh, some of them are, are those, and other ones are lights, and other ones are skylights. Ah. So it's a mix match. So you can see here that you have lights. Another ones are, as you, you see, the in and out of mm -hmm. the air condition. And I think it's not on this no, area. I mean, I mean on the actual seating area, you have those. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Mm. Yeah, these ones are, are also for that. But uh, on the ceiling as well, these ones. Yeah, I think that you were mentioning these ones. Yeah, very nice. It's a quite well integrated uh, uh, design. This one. You have the comfort of the timber, not only on the on the on the court of this multi-purpose uh, pavilion, but also on the on the stands. And also by depressing the level of the playing space. Uh, the height of the building on the outside is sort of yeah, brought into right a yeah. yeah. You are going to see the, if I have the drawings here, there are massive foundations on this building. Hmm. Yes, I have it. You, you can see it here. So this is, this is the seafront. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So you have the seafront here, you have sea here, you have the entrance of the, all the several shipyards. 
that are around here. So it, this was already came to the to the sea. This all this this area here. These are embankments. So the foundations of this building they are quite quite long. This uh, this uh, this piling here is quite it's quite long. It's a very functional and uh, rational project, but has some nuances that are nice to it. And as you can see here, so, sorry about the, the pixels, but this is, is the sea level, and this is the court level. It's the same level, basically. So it's almost like a ship in its section. Yes, yes. When you enter, it's like the, the building. It's a massive ship that entered the land. And uh, you enter to the, so you have the, the dock level underneath the machines, that is the, all the functions of the, of the pavilion. And then on the ground floor, you have the entrances for the, for the areas of, of the building. It's a, I think it's a very interesting project. And as you can see, the highest, like on the surroundings, these are the highest buildings. It's one, two, three, four stories. It, it's, it couldn't be like a massive building there. If you were putting this on top, you were going to gain another level, and then probably another level to all, for all services. So in a way, you get a discrete building by being smart. Some sections, that's it. So this is another project uh, with a partnership. Sorry, if my presentation is going too long, just shut me out. No, then. no, David, please continue. It's very nice. Thank you. It's almost done. We are in 2015, as you can see. The last project that I have here uh, is from 2018. And I wanted to speak uh, about other projects that I saw from a presentation from Sotmora last year. Uh, but I couldn't find uh, any decent uh, pictures, so I, I opt to, to not show them at all. But I will talk about them. So this is an, uh, some equipment, um, facility equipments for uh, dedicated to tourism, mainly for you to rent some um, some materials uh, to to use on on the water. Uh, I believe that they have some other purposes. I couldn't find, although I, I was uh, nearby this project. Uh, I, I, I think these photos are quite old and uh, there are some kind of greenery around here already. So these are quite concealed now. I, 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 at least I couldn't uh, find this project when I was on this island. And uh, it, this goes a little bit uh, against this normal language, but although uh, it goes against his normal language, also re uh, remind us the one building that I showed before from 2001, that was a housing complex uh, that was all covered uh, with roller blinds, with shutters, and that metal look of, of a metal box. But as I say, and here you can see already that example, I believe that this right now i couldn't find the uh, pictures from nowadays they are more uh, full with greenery all over the place and it, the building probably is more concealed and to be fair with all this blazing around it and these islands it's either very misty or very sunny you cannot exactly see that this kind of building and this construction since it's not exactly massive will disturb that much the the landscape. And as I say, these are buildings to, to have like uh, coffee shops, restaurants, services for you to rent bikes, to rent kayaks, like you see here, um, small boats to, to go around the lagoon. And yeah, it, pretty much it, as you can see here, basically people just take these and go to the lagoon and have a good time there. Even if you are a local or you are a tourist. And here you can see some coffee shops on, on the other extremity. And as I said, it's either a very misty island or very sunny.
So this museum here, I, I still wanted to put more pictures. Uh, this was the one that I lost the, the pictures, I don't know why. And I ended up just putting pictures and not putting drawings uh, because it, it is another uh, rehabilitation, rehabilitation and extension of um, a convent. Uh, I think this one actually was not a convent, it was a monastery. And this, it was done in partnership with uh, Alvar Cesar, and this from 2016 in St. Tears. So this, since is Abad Pedroza, I'm pretty sure that was a monastery because Abad refers to the uh, male version of um, of monks in Portugal. So I'm pretty sure that will be that. And this is the extension, although here you can see search, uh, the church associated with the, this um, uh, religious complex. And here, another one as well. So this is a small one. And this is our, it's the, the bigger one. So this will, will be, not exactly a cathedral, but will be the main church of the of the of this population or of this um, locality, and this will just be a small chapel of it. And as you can see, all the surroundings are very flat, again very grounded architecture, and it was traditionally to be on small villages and small locations in Portugal. The um, from medieval times the highest building will be either the city wall or will be the religious buildings from from the place or some kind of a um, government uh, building and all the other ones will be very very grounded or one two story levels and here as i say so this is still have some kind of religious purpose and then this one as well then you have the museum that serves more as a historical museum rather than another thing now but follows the, the same language. And here, maybe it was because of the partnership with CISA again, but also it's very common on the on Portuguese architecture language in, in general. You can see the following of, I'm going to zoom on this one. So you see here, all of this built, be built in stone instead of being simply painted or a, a different material, but it's not uh, not as exactly as a, that novel ma material. It's quite usual on this kind of architecture, religious architecture, and you follow the sign uh, here, which which is something that you normally see almost in all the buildings from Caesar and, and a lot of them from Sotomora inside. This uh, idea of a podium on the wall uh, in Portuguese the the, the the name for, for this is uh, Soku. So it's a kind of embasement that you have of the building on the wall and then you have the, the rest. And that gives uh, you protection from the building in terms of the weather, in terms of uh, the structure of the material. Uh, imagine that you, at the time, medieval times and so on, you will have horse, horses uh, going around, uh, uh, another I don't know, beast vehicles uh, pushing and going towards the building. So this gives you a, a kind of robust build up from the ground level. But again, what, what is interesting here, it's the, the integration on the landscape. You have several lines here going up and down. You have the seal, you have the roof, you have the building that is, that is flat. Then you have a ramp that con uh, leads you to the building but it's quite well integrated. And as you can see here, this landscape more in the north is more hilly, but the, the build up it's on a, a, on a plateau where the village is located. And this is the new build, and this is the existing ones. And you can see that there is an analogy within the, the language that was used to it. It's nothing, something very shocking. And although you can recognize that this is a completely new build that goes against and enters this, that is the, the natural one, the, the original one, you don't see something that is clearly shocking and is well integrated. And as a nice uh, human scale relation with the pedestrians that are passing by, 
creates these narrow passage and tensions that are very delightful to walk in. And uh, the shadows that goes from the old building to the new ones are quite amazing. And the inside, you have again that uh, language of the that in ground level in basement that there it's used for people to navigate towards the the different rooms from public areas to the inside of the rooms and if you notice here parts of the room if it if it is already a room may still have it but these are mainly for public accesses so areas that are more sophisticated with um, with people passing by will be more protected and will guide them through and then you have the spaces within that are are different uh, again these pictures probably are completely different now if you're going to this museum this probably is a shop of the museum and uh, this uh, for the looks of the coffee machine will be the cafeteria that is this space and again you see here public area more people attending, well, not now, probably with the coronavirus, but uh, you have stone walls as long as high as a, a, po a person will, will go. And then this staircase, uh, I couldn't find again the, the sketches, but there were a lot of sketches from both Siza and Sotmor uh, to this staircase, and you can see the quantity of detail that the staircase has, the tensions between the space and so on. I would say that these stairs, you might have a, a different opinion, but I would say that they are the, almost the start of the inside of the project. Not saying the outside, but at least the inside. The amount of effort and detail put on this staircase, that is the main core of it, is, is something else. You see the here the the tensions between what is completely fixed and this one that comes from uh, below and, and then doesn't touch uh, the the ones that are carrying on up uh, upwards are quite nice. Again, this detail. You have gaps for light and mm. and shadow to pass by. You can see feet or of different people or imagining that are passing by here and you can see from the dance, downstairs. And again, you have one piece, two pieces of stone, another one, another one, all differently designed and crafted in, into perfection to the place. And here we enter uh, the area of the existing pool that was refurbished at, at some of it. Another part, uh, it's a little bit of new build inside of the old building. But there is a lot of detailing also on the exhibition um, items. Sorry, uh, on the exhibition um, <coughs> um, furniture items. As you can see here, they are all thinked through how they, they work. It is uh, as well uh, our interior architecture design and not only architecture design. The same with other pieces of furniture and leads to this very nicely crafted building. And you can see the whole complex of here. This new piece doesn't disturb at all with the, all the rest that was, was there before. You can see that here the roof is new but is following the same uh, materiality and the same materials used uh, on the original ones. And that's it. So this here was done together with, uh, <coughs> with uh, a Greek architect, Yanis um, um, Kornelis. And it, is a, it was a, pav a small pavilion that is very interesting and kind of a way poetic as you may find it. So in Outside, it's just a box, looks like a box that normally carries, uh, I would say, pieces of art or archaeology um, items, um, archaeology uh, findings. But inside, 
you have a yellow space with a stair that looks almost, I don't know, the first time that I saw this project, I, I remember myself of the uh, story with Raven from Led Zeppelin. And uh, it's kind of a poetic space. It, it's not a, about the functionality of, of the space in this project, I, I think so. It's not exactly something that you, I don't know, what can you fit on this space. Uh, but it, it's a sense of it that you have with the materiality and light. It's like you are going inside of a box and then for some reason you want to escape or explore that alternative and you have this project. This is, will be the, the last project. And before I, sp I, I talk about this project, there was an, another project that I wanted to present uh, that is a dam that at least late 2019 was still, if it was not built, uh, already finished, was almost, uh, almost finished. Um, but I couldn't find um, decent pictures because the pictures that I saw on the conference from Sotmoto, of course, it was from his studio, so he would have plenty to show off. But uh, internet is not as generous, so I opt to not use because that project itself it is a dam. So the project was a partnership between Sotmoto and uh, also other engineers, because a dam normally is a work for engineers. But th there was a lot of craft and work uh, as architect from from himself, uh, himself there, and I. The work uh, was carried out on the UNESCO landscape uh, uh, heritage area, and it was changed quite a lot of times until obey to the requirements of uh, that protected area. So it's not fair to for me to show a project that as it, it used to be, since now it is completely different, and I would think that will not add any value. So feel free to research. Uh, but uh, and uh, I can type it down on the chat the name of the project afterwards. But uh, I, I opt to not choose. Instead, I put this one here that looks like a um, basic Pale Paleo Christian chapel uh, that are built from massive pieces of stone. This was um, um, set in, in Venice. And all of these, I'm not kidding, they are massive pieces of stone, all carved together basically without any joint whatsoever of another material. And uh, they are almost just put in place by assemblage. As you can see here, you can see some assemblage details and give the space this nice, treatment to it. The light that you can see from the space, from inside, outside, it is always outside, but you have some kind of uh, covering and arbor. It's some kind of uh, small mystic project in itself. And uh, I think it's quite nicely done. And not only it's, it's very simple, Although I, I would not say that it's very cheap to make. It's quite an expensive project for a small, so small scale project. It has a very nice relation with the, with the surroundings. And that's it. Thank you. So I don't know if someone still have uh, enough energy for questions or anyone wants to ask something or if then should carry on with uh, his presentation. Very nice, David. Thank you very much. That's all right. No, no, uh, really, <clears throat> if we can find a few more uh, uh, generous people like you to make presentations from time to time, so it will be, a, you know, a collective uh, 
action, I think uh, uh, it will be very nice. Because really, we have a chance. I mean, I learned a lot just by uh, uh, contemplating your presentation, and I'm sure the others also learned and are incited to do further research if they want to, um, you know, deepen their knowledge of certain things. So uh, I think this is a time that we earned, we didn't lose. I'm just going to find uh, that project, the, the name of it, the, the dam, for uh, people to have a look if they want. And well, I don't know. I don't know. Then it's with you. If you want me to pass you over the ball for you to carry on with the presentation, well, you could. But I, I don't know if the others are still uh, um, willing to. Okay, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, is it? Is it? To anyone, or if anyone wants a question or something like that, I can show again any particular project. So what I'm saying is, uh, you know, I could do the presentation about Aratai um, Sozaki, um, but we could also do it tomorrow. Uh, I don't, I, I don't think we should, uh, you know, be uh, excessive, although <laughs> I am excessive, but um, you don't have to follow me on that necessarily. You know, either we have a discussion now about what we saw, or if you still have a little bit of energy, the the presentation on our, our, our Arata Isozaki is not so ample. So I imagine in about 45 minutes at the most uh, will uh, will end. So then we'd have two Pritzker Prize uh, um, winners, uh, you know, joining uh, us on the same day. Well, okay, you know, sometimes I, 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 I learn something from this presentation. Sometimes I have to take, uh, you know, the, the decision myself uh, without waiting for too long because uh, we have other things to do too, or especially you have other things to do. If you allow me, I will, I will make a, a, this uh, condensed uh, presentation about an interesting Japanese architect. And maybe it would be interesting to compare now Japan with Europe. Japan with Portugal. So, uh, David, could you give me back the right to, or maybe I don't need to receive it back? Uh, yes, for sure. I think that you have. I, uh, I yeah, you are as host, so you, you can uh, okay. keep me out and do it or just carry on. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll I'm just going to mute myself. What is going on here? <clears throat> okay, so do you see the name Arata Isozaki? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I didn't write when he was born. He is still alive, but uh, he must be over ninety. He was one of the, you know, the the early heroes almost of, of uh, Japan, Japanese uh, modern architecture and a uh, very enduring architect. And as I saw him actually lecturing at Columbia University many years ago, he described himself as be, being his, uh, this uh, schizo-eclecticist. And you can see many influences in his work, but somehow uh, he's, he was able to, to uh, negotiate between them uh, through his personality and uh, um, his buildings remain um, or become Arata Isozaki. Doesn't matter how many influences from Palladio to I don't know what. Even his, uh, you know, persona is uh, interesting. You know, is you wonder, is he a man? Is he a woman? Uh, is uh, is romantic. Uh, he's, uh, he, he, he is, he was an, an, an interesting man. And uh, I mean, like here, for example, you know. <laughs> anyway, 
being that he was and he is a star, uh, there are all kinds of you know uh, interesting uh, pictures with him. He has an artistic side that is uh, uh, receiving uh, quite well, uh, you know, uh, uh, creative interpretations of his persona. But just like the other Japanese uh, famous architects, uh, Isozaki uh, has the great, great change to be rooted in the, in the, in the great traditions and even myths of, of his culture. And this distinguishes Japan from uh, many other parts of the world. Doesn't matter how much they, they flirt with, uh, with what is the newest, uh, they still have that, that safe, uh, safe net of connection with, um, with, uh, with the, oldest, um, the oldest traditions. But he did, <clears throat> he did a, a, a drawing, a collage. I will start with a collage from 1968. Uh, that is incredible in my opinion, because he anticipated architecture that was done at least 20, 25 years later. This is Hiroshima Blast site, Electric City from 1968. Like other Japanese uh, architects, he, uh, um, uh, he had an interest in uh, envisioning, uh, you know, uh, a, a new beginning in a way, not just for Japan, for, but for the whole world and to, to come out, to, 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 to turn the back. No, 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 I'm not saying it well. To, to assume the, the terrible war, the Second World War, but to go beyond the ashes, to, 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 to start again. And uh, he did this drawing, uh, or this kind of a collage, no? But that, this kind of building, or this kind of structure that he imagined there, uh, you know, is it very close to our time, you know? I mean, from what he did here in Le, Le Musée de Confluence by Kopf um, Himmelblau uh, in Lyon, it's not a, it's not a big distance. Uh, and so he had great un anticipative powers. Of course, what we see in the foreground is very, very sad. It's the sad, sad, sad reality of, of the fact that we human beings are uh, unable to, to avoid war. And, uh, and uh, this is a meditation, an architectural meditation on, uh, on that sad reality. Uh, so he did this collage in 1968, uh, 1965, 1968. But I will start with his early buildings. Uh, Oita Medical Hall from 1960, which was uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, very highly publicized, not just by the Japan architect and A plus U, important Japanese publications, but also um, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, Architectural Review, and so on. Because in 1960, already Japan was, was insinuating itself or herself, the country, into a superpower in architecture. And it was doing so because of its heroic stance. And it, was, it wasn't just Arata Isozaki. It was mainly starting with Kenzo Tange, and I have great emotion when I talk about these young architects. They were emerging from a terribly devastating uh, country from the Second World War. And, and, and it, surprisingly and paradoxically, they were envisioning a, a cosmos of hope for humanity at large. And you can see this heroic side of architecture very much present. Also in Arata Isozaki's case, also in the case of um, uh, other architects um, uh, from, from that time. And maybe one, one week we could dedicate the whole week to the architecture of Japan because it is worthy. Uh, okay, now I don't have very high uh, resolution pictures, unfortunately, but you can still see it. Yes, it, it's, it's a brutalist uh, work as it is described. It, it uses concrete. It is rough, it is heroic, uh, it is masculine, it is, uh, it, 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 is, it is the architectonic expression of human beings who want to go beyond uh, suffering and, 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 and uh, 
the inevitable uh, um, uh, lamenting and and to to build a new world a new a new a new world world and uh, around that that time as i said also uh, kenzo kenzo tange the father of, in a way the father of modern architecture or the orthodox father because there were other fathers before him but it's always uh, this is the case when we call someone a father in in a cultural field there are other, um, you know, so-called fathers, not just that one. Um, yes, uh, if you compare, and uh, we'll, we'll arrive at his latest works, uh, you can see that he goes from being heroic and rough to a mundane uh, period and because he achieved success and Japan uh, achieved success economically and, uh, and otherwise. But, but something of that experimental stage remained to him until, uh, until today. So this is a medical center, but it's a medical center for heroes. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a medical center for, for people who don't need a medical center in a way, if I can put it so. Now, you know, we talked about, uh, about uh, Japan architecture. We talk about Japan and Japanese architects. How come that this country has the largest number of Pritzker Prize uh, uh, winners? You know, there must be something about them. It's not the biggest country in the world. It's not the most advan advantaged or, or, or uh, you know, uh, privileged uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, its natural resources, quite the opposite. It is confronted with tornadoes, with uh, all kinds of cataclysms and catastrophes. And yet this country in the field of architecture does have the largest number of Pritzker Prize winners. Now the Pritzker Prize itself is not really, uh, you know, the, the absolute, uh, you know, uh, value stick but 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 it does say something and uh, and uh, i think uh, considering the, the the level of experimentation the the, the courage they have uh, is uh, is something to be admired anyway uh, this uh, i don't know a block of flats for student families in malmo in sweden 1966 i i prepared this presentation a while ago and i forgot about this work and I'm a little bit surprised that he actually built almost, um, you know, some of his earliest buildings uh, were in Sweden, or this one at least. But this one also is sculptural, is, is, is rhythmic, is, is vigorous, and uh, in, in that sense, it, it gives hope. Now, we arrive another, at another very important work by him, a, a really a quintessential work, the Oita Prefectural Library, so what we saw here was the, the, the Oita uh, Medical Center. Now, uh, in the same year, uh, Oita Prefectural Library, this was also highly publicized. And here it is. It is a building that, that uh, in a way, expresses the unending quest for knowledge. It's not a... I mean, it is a building, it is static. It doesn't grow towards light like a blade of grass. It is true, it is not nature, but it expresses the human quest for a certain beyond. And I remember now uh, a very beautiful, I think, uh, definition of, of, of human beings by uh, Gaston Bachelard. You know, he said it simply, he said, human beings are creatures of desire, not of need. Very interesting distinction. Of course, need and desire are kind of relatives, but they are also very, very different. When you say that human beings are creatures of desire, you already uh, set some very high standards. In fact, immeasurable, immeasurably high, because this is what desire is. It represents 
a longing, you long for the beyond, you long for the unknown, you long for the immeasurable, for the infinite, for the absolute, for God. It, we can use various names, but I think we come back to what Bashlar, I think, said very well. Human beings are creatures of desire, not of need. And it is exactly this desire that makes us continuously questing and questioning and, and, and creating and uh, uh, I think we should never forget this, that we are indeed creatures of desire. And we see this building, this is a, also a desiring building, because what else are those, uh, you know, uh, horizontal, uh, um, you know, uh, if I can call them tubes, uh, you know, that extend beyond the limits of the building. They do represent that, that, that longing for, 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 uh, for more. And, uh, you know, of course, there is the theory, you know, which was connected to metabolism, the, the, the Japanese uh, movement that united various uh, brilliant uh, Japanese architects in their quest to, to envision a new future and so on. So this is a part of the, the ideology of, of metabolism, but expressed through the language, the, the specifics of the language of uh, architectural language of Arata Isozaki. In other words, it's not a static object, but it is part of a larger organism that could come into being, that it might come or it might not come, but it is prepared to develop in case that would be the case. So I see here this very wise and, 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 and uh, uh, philosophically very legitimate uh, attempt to unite being with becoming something we often forget. That's why many buildings are just objects, meaning they are just concerned with being, but ignore becoming. This building, in its own uh, formal uh, choices, attempts to not neglect becoming. And, uh, uh, you know, otherwise it's kind of, um, you know, approximately a rational, rationalistic building, Cartesian building, but as I said, this preoccupation with becoming, with the activism of, 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 of process, uh, makes it escape, uh, you know, an unbearable, um, um, you know, uh, rigidity. Uh, this is what I see here, you know, human beings are creatures of desire. This is what I see. Uh, and uh, and uh, when I see this, I I I I, uh, I feel uh, I feel uh, um, you know uplifted. Now you see, at the time when this picture was taken, there was a, a banner there announcing an exhibition of his works within the building. Uh, the building is uh, rough, you know. It's not it's not a it's not a pretty building in that um, you know hallmark way. It's not pink. It's not uh, beautified. But the quest for knowledge shouldn't be too you know uh, pretty or too soft or too I don't know what. Uh, it, 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 it it is a it is a it is a difficult journey. And some of some of the interiors, although it is a, a, a you know, it's not a it's not a church, it's not it's not a place for um, you know sacred uh, concerns, but but still, you know, it's it's at the edge, you know, you, the, the furnitures or so are are connecting with the terrestrial uh, life. But when you see how the light comes in and, uh, you know, the, uh, the robustness of the, of, of, of the breaking of the roof creates some kind of uh, dialogue with, with the vertical. Dan? Yes? Sorry to interrupt you, but it seems to be a waste of a lot of concrete, doesn't it? A what? Waste of a lot of concrete. Well, you know, what about the waste of the, the Egyptian pyramids? I mean, if we, we, if we, first of all, he, you know, I, 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 I am very much on the side of uh, sustainability and uh, working with, uh, you know, uh, the minimum of means. 
but architecture is, uh, is is complex you know it's a plus with building a, in, in this was done at a different time uh, i don't think they were concerned so much with uh, you know wasting uh, concrete I, I i think they wanted to express something and and uh, yeah you can you can uh, you can criticize maybe the the you know the the so called waste but uh, you know uh, much much of, of 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 the greatness of architecture unfortunately it is built with waste you know uh, in fact uh, philip johnson uh, and i'm not really so uh, you know um, uh, so happy maybe to 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 quote from him but uh, you know, he said that uh, architecture is the art of losing, wasting space. Uh, maybe the very, the very architecture, the, the simplest architectural gesture, the first building in, in itself is some kind of a minus. Like, uh, like Louis Kahn said that uh, a piece of water, a piece of uh, paper, just blank, white piece of paper, uh, uh, is uh, w w when you, when you add, a line to it is less than than the whiteness of the piece of paper so you could say the same thing about adding a building on the earth it's already a subtraction and an addition at the same time i'm not trying to defend um, arata isozaki but i think his concerns were very different from uh, our concerns today because they were confronted with they, they were emerging from the ashes of the second world war and uh, they wanted to express this heroic effort because I'm sure it was an immense effort from from that country to 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 go beyond grief. And uh, of course, they you know the grief. Uh, I mean, they were not so innocent. They they, they took part in the war in a, in a certain way. But mm -hmm. you know, imagine the the nuclear bomb was dropped twice on Japan. Yeah. And uh, I have to tell you something. Just a month ago, I asked a friend to um, publish a book, uh, not a book, uh, an image on, uh, on, uh, on Facebook, because I don't use Facebook. But one image was with, uh, you know, dead bodies from the Hiroshima. And uh, the immediate, immediately he attempted to publish that book. His uh, Facebook account was frozen. And he, re he received a message that for 24 hours, his account, his Facebook account, account would, be, would, be, would be shut off uh, uh, because, because he attempted to publish what, what Facebook called an undecent picture. Now, I am very sorry, but, but uh, I, I don't think a picture with, with dead bodies from Hiroshima could be called undecent. You know, this is not about undecency. In fact, what, he, what is undecent is not to, not to uh, be aware and acknowledge the horrors of war. That is undecent. And uh, something is upside down here. But coming back to, 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 to Isozaki, and he was not the only one. They, they, they did use a lot of concrete. I mean, you could say also that even um, the, the Portuguese architect that David... Uh, showed us uh, today uh, use concrete sometimes a lot like for the roof of those houses you know he could have used uh, timber but he used concrete so yes you know uh, there is always something to criticize but uh, you know uh, again you know they they i think the japanese at that time wanted to express uh, you know solidity force uh, um, you know, uh, immutability in a way, uh, because they were trying to encourage themselves, I guess, uh, you know, uh, in, in the heroic mode to, to, to accomplish what they had to accomplish. And, and I think they did. I mean, it's absolutely amazing that the countries that, that have been, had been, um, uh, you know, uh, so-called the, the, the losers of the Second World War actually became in a short time incredible uh, economic powers and cultural powers. I'm talking about Germany and Japan. And this was done, I'm convinced, with great, great effort. And uh, we, we, we have to acknowledge uh, that, you know, these people, uh, you know, accomplish so much uh, through, through sacrifices, great sacrifices. Anyway, um, 
this was not a time for nostalgias and for, uh, and I, I don't think the building is arrogant. It's just expressing uh, that, that, that country's, um, you know, priorities at that time. It, it had to encourage itself, you know, and that's, that was a way um, through which they, they attempted to do this. They also wanted to show themselves that they, they could become modern. They could become forward looking. And, uh, you know, uh, around that time, any countries used a lot of concrete. Now, maybe less, but at that time, uh, it was different. Anyway, um, also around that time, because I have a collection of uh, Japan architects, they built a lot of buildings for, for children. Uh, many interesting schools and kindergartens and educational centers. I think they had a national, uh, uh, you know, policy to 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 uh, to emancipate themselves through education. Without doubt, the, whatever road they chose, Japan was successful, because uh, I don't know if too many countries in the world ravaged by two uh, nuclear bombs would have been able in just a question of an, a few years to, to, uh, to become, uh, you know, uh, leaders in, in the economic field and not just economy, but, you know, in technology. And uh, I actually think they, they were incredible. Even now, things that were made in Japan where they were unbelievably well made. You can buy, you know, in a flea market, uh, you know, um, radio or a cassette player, Sony or Sanyo or Hitachi or Toshiba or I don't know, you name it, made in the 60s and works perfectly. And it is de designed to the most minute detail, unbelievably. I mean, <laughs> really, they, 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 I think they were incredible and, and, and maybe less now, but uh, that time they were. Anyway, um, you saw the drawing that he did, you know, with that uh, apocalyptic uh, landscape where, where Hiroshima was, uh, you know, totally erased from, the, wiped out from the face of the earth. And then he imagined that uh, structure which would have been very fashionable now. Well, I, when I look at this building, I would say this is about the heroism of, 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 of culture and the heroism of the quest for culture. And, and I'm afraid that these days we don't, ha we don't have a heroic attitude vis-a-vis -vis culture. I think that we have a chance now, particularly now, that the virus is creating us uh, uh, incredible problems. We have a chance to find some kind of a refuge or another reality, an alternate reality in the cultural field and in the spiritual field. And, and, and instead, what do I see? That when the restrictions were lifted in London, people flooded the pubs as if the pub was the, the ultimate destination for human happiness. You know, I mean, this saddens me very much. This is what we reduce life to, the pub, and we are talking about one of the greatest cities in the world, London. People who are educated, people who go to museums, people who see great books, who have the great books. And what do we learn? To go to the pub? I mean, you know, when are we going to wake up? You know, uh, 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 so... What I see here, this is, I am absolutely sure that the Japanese at that time didn't go to the, tub, to, to the pub. They, they worked very, 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 very hard. And, uh, um, you know, by the way of this, I mentioned there is a film, uh, a movie called um, uh, Noodle Soup, a Japanese, where a group of businessmen uh, goes into a, you know, into a restaurant and they were celebrating something and uh, you know they entered hierarchically the the shortest man was also the the ceo and the tallest man was the man who was making xerox copies the also the youngest so they entered into the restaurant and because there was a big event 
the man who, you know, the, the, the host uh, comes to them with a list of champagnes and asks them which champagne they would prefer to drink. And amusingly, but also realistically, the movie shows that these people who rebuild Japan knew nothing about champagne. That's not how you rebuild a country, going to the pub and drinking champagne. So, you know, because they knew who was the most important person there, the waiter goes to him and say, what, which champagne do you like, sir? And, and, and that man knew absolutely nothing about champagne. He looks at the next man, you know, uh, a little bit uh, under him. Uh, he didn't know either. And the only one he knew was the last man, the, the very young one who was raised in a different uh, time, a time of prosperity. And so here was the man who was doing Xerox copies, who didn't have an important you know, position in the company. He began to say, well, uh, that, that, that champagne is nice, but not from that year. I need it from either three years later or three years earlier. And could you bring me, please, one with a taste a little bit, not so bitter, but a little bit sweeter? I mean, and this is a great uh, analogy or metaphor for, for how societies work. Those who heroically rebuild the country have no time for champagne and have no time for, for pub, pubs and so on. But coming back to us, because I think the, the so-called past has com completely no relevance unless we relate to it. So my question is, what are we going to do now at this time of crisis? Are we going to rush to the pub? Are we going to waste these days? Or are we going to re-spiritualize our lives, reculturalize uh, our lives, and become very, very serious about li what life is, what death is, what perishability is, uh, uh, what creativity is, and so on. I, I think in a certain way, this virus is forcing us to ask again the difficult questions. Because there were too many years of uh, laissez-faire, of mundanity, you know, only superficial things were discussed both on, on the media, on, on the internet, and so on. And it's still the case, this one as you well know. Anyway, we continue. But personally, I like this heroic representation of the quest for knowledge, which a library perhaps should, uh, should uh, evoke. Now, a sports facility, uh, he did uh, several buildings a little bit similar. Now we are already growing in time in 1973, 1974. Uh, he is, you see, there is already a transformation, you know, the curves show up, uh, it's almost a premonition of postmodernism a little bit, and, uh, you know, the, the forms are more refined, and the surfaces are softer and cleaner, and so the, 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 the heroism is beginning to, to recede. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, a certain sensuality shows up, of course, because once you see, be, begin to see the light at the, the end of the tunnel, uh, you know, uh, the rough beginnings uh, might not tempt you uh, so much, including the function of the building. Now, this is a sports facility and a well-being center is not a library. Uh, and uh, the shape of the building uh, kind of says it all. Now, another library from 1974, uh, 70, 74, which also is different from the one we saw from 1966. So you see, just in uh, no seven years, yeah, about seven years, from 66 to 73, seven years, big changes. This is actually similar to the sports uh, facility that we saw before. But since nothing is new in the world and since the, there are recurring events uh, and recurring uh, cycles in the history of the world, brutalismus come back, comes back. Uh, two years ago, there was a big exhibition in, La in Vienna and I imagine it traveled in other cities. 
called SOS brutalismus. And so that period from 1960s in Japan, and not only in Japan, uh, uh, came to came to to our fore, so to speak, again in uh, uh, in uh, inciting and provocative way or ways. Personal, I prefer, uh, but it's a subjective uh, preference, of course. Uh, the previous library, because here things are already settled. You know, you can tell this is a prosperous country. And uh, so the library represents that. Now, an art museum, Kita Kyushu Art Museum, uh, also, uh, you know, with, with but here the, the, the heroic uh, positioning or, or stance is, is uh, um, it becomes almost, uh, if I can say so, a little bit decorative. Uh, it becomes a little bit ornamental, um, although, it, you know, at a different scale, something from that library in 1966 is repeated. Um, here we have, uh, you know, some uh, some uh, digital drawings. the grid and the square does uh, do appear in his work uh, in, in various uh, um, ways. He's not totally, uh, um, you know, divorced from rationalism or from that kind of so-called enlightenment that, uh, that seems to be still uh, very attractive to many people. But there is also the temptation of, of um, constructivism and, uh, you know, uh, some kind of structural, um, you know, uh, acrobatics here and there. Now, another museum, he built a lot of museums. Um, now, unfortunately, we can tell that we are approaching or, or we are already uh, uh, in you know, suffocated almost, uh, or, or, or beginning to be uh, poisoned by the embrace of postmodernism. I truly think postmodernism was, was a cancer for architecture, uh, because we couldn't assimilate history in, 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 in creative terms, in deep ways. So we began to use columns, you know, uh, and not just columns, in, 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 uh, in ways that were not sufficiently uh, um, uh, you know, with discernment, uh, you need some kind of discrimination. You need some uh, in, in order to 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 work with uh, your head turned backwards. You have to 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 do it in such a way that it doesn't become, uh, you know, uh, just a, a simple uh, or a simplistic uh, game of borrowings. And unfortunately, the schizoeclecticist that Arata Isozaki uh, was and is became a victim himself. Yeah, uh, we saw, we, we can see many examples of, in fact, in fact, if we, if we, if we look at a building that Kengo Kuma, of all people, built in a postmodern key, so to speak, in the, uh, in around that time, you know, late 70s, early 80s, we won't believe our, our eyes. I don't have a picture right now with it, but it's, it's simply outrageous. Uh, uh, so it affected, you know, very noble architects or architects who knew better at least, uh, anyway. So there is something unconvincing for me in, 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 in this kind of, uh, you know, uh, colonnade and uh, you know, you, you, you can tell it's, it's, it's stage design. It's not really architecture as I, as I see it. Now, Tsukuba Center Building, this is a, he has these uh, graphic representations that are quite, uh, um, I don't know if I can say unique, but if you see drawings kind of like or collages in, in done now, they are 
drawings, they are, uh, you know, perspectival uh, uh, representations. These are done by Arata Isozaki's office. I don't know if he did them uh, manually himself, but what you can see, you see, you see remnants of buildings, you see ruins. So again, we are dealing with an architect who is not unaware of death. So his, uh, his uh, melancholy in a certain way about, uh, about that ruin that tells you how the building was made to, to remember Louis Kahn, but also tells you how the building will be made. In other words, it will be the, 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 the una, una, unavoidable, uh, uh, um, you know, so-called development or regression of the building because any building that goes up one day will come down. And, and for an architect, this must be a very painful knowledge. You know, uh, you, 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 of course you can uh, ignore this reality, but uh, yeah, what goes up goes down and sooner or later. And, and uh, this sobering uh, fact, I think, should be present in the minds and the hearts of any architect. And maybe then we'll be kind of like Louis Sullivan, who wrote both about the pessimist and the, and the optimist. And maybe an architect who is both, although architects like to think that they are um, uh, optimists almost by definition, because it's hard to, to build otherwise, I think actually the, the, the most profound of the architects cannot ignore, um, you know, the, the, the truth actually, that, that the building that goes up will also go down. So when uh, Wolf Prix was asked, uh, what is your definition of architecture? In a, um, uh, he said it in a, in, a, in a lecture at Harvard. He said, yes. So what is architecture? He asks himself, and he says, yes. It's, a, it's an amusing, uh, whimsical answer, because you don't know what he says, uh, he, he, you don't know what, what, what question he's answering with this yes. It, it is ambiguous, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it is perhaps worth saying a few words about the, fa about the fact that in the latest a um, movie made with his works, I'm talking about Wolf Briggs and Comte Himmelblau, which I saw a DVD uh, of. The last thing he shows is the house of his parents in a little town in Austria where he was born, where he just repainted the facade in a kind of a pink, but once he opened the door and entered the courtyard and the whatever was there, some garden and the building, was a total ruin. I mean, he didn't change anything. In, in fact, what I saw there was a, a clear no, not a clear yes. There was not the, the slightest attempt to fight death. In fact, it, let, it allowed nature to take over the building, dust, uh, everything became a ruin. So what I'm trying to say is that even someone who says architecture is yes, even that someone flirts somewhere or knows the other side of the story. And the other side of the story we can also see in this, uh, in this artwork, because you can see the fragmented walls, you know, and uh, this connects with that first image that we saw of Hiroshima that he, 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 he drew. Now, of course, you know, here we have Campidoglio, you know, with a little fountain, uh, I, I almost said a little pathetical uh, fountain, because to, to put something like that in the center, when in Rome is the emperor Marc Aurelius, uh, is, uh, is a quotation from uh, Il Campidoglio in Rome that is not doing justice to, to that place in Rome. Uh, but this was the time, you know, uh, a prosperous uh, Japan, uh, you know, importing all kinds of ideas and, and uh, you know, uh, appropriating them sometimes more seriously, other times less seriously. Yeah. Yeah, so there is, a, you know, a, a small, uh, <laughs> a small homage, if you want to, Il Campidoglio in Rome, but, um, 
it, to my taste, not very convincing because it's literal. Is uh, is um, if I can call it so, graphic literature. It's illustration. But at that time, many other architects worked in this way. Charles Correa in the United States, and then of course you had the, the famous uh, trio of Venturi, Scott Brown, and uh, you know, postmodernism was uh, was full of. Uh, of color and um, quotations and historicism, and uh, but it only showed despair because I lived in that uh, period of time and I I know what it meant. Uh, we 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 were simply uh, 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 um, how to say grasping the past. The past we were. Um, um, I, I don't find now the the correct word in English. We we're trying to 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 hang on to a past because we are afraid to step in the new millennium without the assurance of that past. And uh, once we crossed the threshold, uh, of course, things became easier. And now nobody would do something like this. But then in the 80s, uh, early 90s, but especially in the 80s, it was like this. It was this uh, disaster called postmodernism. I call it disaster, but my, some people might say it was not a disaster. I, I, I don't know. I still consider it a disaster. And it just happened that I worked uh, in the office of Paolo Portoghese in Rome around that time when uh, also the first uh, Venice Biennial was built and Portoghese was its first uh, director or director. Um, and uh, um, so I, I know that period of time quite well. Dan, anyway. can I interrupt you? Uh, Dan? Yes. Dan, can I interrupt you? Sure. Uh, I had read a very interesting thing uh, that uh, modernists, they, they always said that our architecture will last for centuries. Uh, so uh, it's like, uh, 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 what do you call, something like infinity. And when infinity ends, uh, then you have uh, every. I don't hear you any longer. Uh, I mean, uh, it is like a situation which is very... I don't hear you any longer. Hello? The net connection is not... Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? I hear you now. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Then... Uh, Again, I don't hear you. That's all I do not I'd read uh, about this. Uh, the that's all I don't. No hear problem. It. Can you hear me or no? I don't. Yeah, hear. I'll do it later. Okay, okay. Yeah, let's not forget no because I'm interested in what you want to say. I, I don't hear you. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me now? Well, yeah, but when you begin to talk, uh, I won't hear you. Try, try again, please. Yeah, I had read an interesting thing about uh, postmodernism that it began just after modernism, and modernism modernists used to say that our architecture will last for in infinity. So it is like when infinity ends, what happens uh, is chaos, and postmodernism was a chaos that happened at the end of infinity. That's what a, a thing I'd read, I just recalled. Okay, Vatsal, thank you. Uh, we can talk uh, some other time about this belief in infinity. First of all, is infinity supposed to end? I mean, then why is it called infinity? Anyway, let's move forward. Uh, here is another drawing graphic work that he did. You can tell he was haunted by, by uh, even here, you know, with his work uh, recently built, I mean, I'm talking about that time, it, it, is, uh, it is ruined. He envisions it being ruined with cracks and so on. So I think Arata Isozaki was, was uh, uh, continuously uh, haunted by, um, by, you know, his experiences as a child in, in, in Japan. But, since uh, uh, life goes on, you see, 
things change. Elegant, uh, you know, uh, forks and spoons and little spoons and glasses and champagne. And uh, who do you think it is here? You know, again, we are having a uh, different reality. This is Isozaki in a luxurious restaurant, and here is Rem Korhas. You know, um, yeah, they seem to be tense or intense, but the table is, uh, you know, is, is a rich table, is, uh, is a table that uh, tells you when our life is uh, not just suffering or is, is, uh, could be also very pleasurable and luxurious. Anyway, you can see from the hair of uh, Arata Isozaki that this was probably in the 90s or so. But what saddens me is that there are many students of architecture, especially here where I'm talking from, who never heard of Arata Isozaki. And uh, uh, as I keep saying, you know, it's not a shame not to know, it's a shame not to want to know. And this alarms me, and that's why I come back to the heroism of culture. We have a chance now here on the Zoom, on our meetings. This is free education, it's open to anyone. You are just one click away from learning something. And, and, and if you choose not to, it shows that you turn your back on, uh, you know, on, uh, on knowledge and on culture, on making a progress in your, on your path and so on. Now, uh, Ceremony, Ceremony House from 1992. Again, this is the great change Japan had and has that uh, it was and it is anchored in very old uh, uh, traditions and mythologies which saves them from doing, uh, even in, when they are superficial, the fact that they are anchored in that past uh, uh, makes even their most foolish and superficial gestures uh, forgivable, at least, if nothing else. Not to speak about the, a certain spirituality that is so present in, 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 in many of their buildings. Because th th this is not a, you know, a big building, but it makes you think uh, about his choices, his formal choices. It, it, is a, uh, it is a building that is not, it doesn't leave you indifferent. And here you see also, you know, looking the other way, the openings of the box, the, the, the tension between the rectangular and the circular. It, it, it's a, it's, it's a, a, an architecture that welcomes even contradiction. Now, a uh, museum, uh, we go a little uh, quicker now, uh, Museum of Art in Miami from 2001, where he, you would say this cannot be Arata Isozaki, but it is. Uh, I, 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 I think he tried to, uh, I don't know the specifics of this building, but I imagine he tried to connect with a certain history of, of, uh, of Miami. Um, Then uh, Central Academy of Fine Arts in, uh, uh, in Beijing, China. This is also a very well-crafted building and uh, it, it makes me think a little bit of the Kiasma building by um, uh, Stephen Hall in Helsinki. Uh, it's, 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 I think yeah, it's, funny you say that. I was thinking the same thing when I saw the picture. <laughs> Actually, Mahadev, I was afraid that I forgot the, 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 the correct word, you know, the chiasma, but I think that's how it was. Uh, yeah, that's how it was said. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> a good building by Stephen Hall, by the way. I, uh, I think he did uh, something good there and I had seen it. I, I have been in Helsinki to build in the vicinity of Alvar Alto is not easy, but he, he, he did it. Anyway, um, this is also not bad by, by Arata Isozaki. And as you can see, it's crafted so well. And uh, I'm glad that the Chinese invited the Japanese architect to build in China. This is also, it's a, you know, it's a gesture of, of, of friendship, although they had, a, a, you know, a big conflict and uh, maybe they don't like each other so much. But you see, this is the power of culture, that it creates bridges even between countries that are not necessarily in the most uh, friendly 
terms with each other, but, but this is the power of art, the power of culture, the, the, the power of poetry, of literature, of painting, you name it. That's why I think it is truly a great, great chance now to reculturalize ourselves, not for the sake of, I mean, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, decorative culture, but truly to have, to, to shift our attention in a different direction. Because we, we were too obsessed with material values, you know, with consuming, consuming, consuming. And I think the world is still very, very rich. It depends what we make with it, with this world. Convention Hall in Nara in Japan. Uh, unfortunately, forgive me for the, the, the resolution of, of the, the image is not very good. Uh, I, I need to work further on this presentation. Uh, I apologize, it's, it's a little bit schematic uh, sometimes. But as a, an introduction to his work, maybe it achieves its goal. So he's not inhibited. He works in various ways, with ellipses, with uh, spirals, with circles, with uh, rectangles. Uh, he is indeed a schizoeclecticist. And what he, you will see also his latest work that was built in Qatar, uh, where he also repeats himself a little bit, but uh, because he did something similar in China, but very different from what you saw until now. Modern Art Museum in Gunma. Now this one is uh, reminds of uh, reminds us of, uh, of uh, earlier works by him. I am not very impressed by this building. Um, Anyway, he built a lot. And, uh, but the way the Rem Kolhas was looking at him, uh, you know, in that discussion in the restaurant uh, shows to me that, uh, uh, and I don't think Rem Kolhas had or has too much respect for too many people, but I think he was respectful towards uh, Arata Isozaki. Uh, from 1986, an art Arch architectural drawing, uh, yeah, such drawings by him are, are uh, many, and uh, this is also something, uh, uh, you know, if I can say so nice, that, you know, he, he uh, built a lot, but he also understood the value of drawing, or uh, collage, or uh, bidimensional representation intellectual, uh, uh, you know, uh, representation of architecture beyond the, you know, the commercial renderings and so on. Now the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, uh, first a drawing, uh, and you see it's reduced to essentials and uh, to, you know, light, shadow, uh, it's graphic, it's uh, a little bit pop because we are talking about uh, Arata Isozaki here. He, he did these things, I imagine, for himself. Or, I mean, he could have had very, um, you know, uh, well executed uh, commercial renderings. These are not commercial. They are, they, here you have an architect exploring the reality of his building uh, uh, in, in abstractum and in, 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 in a language that uh, is, is dense and is pure and is, uh, is not really meant to be, uh, you know, uh, seductive commercially. He built it. He didn't do the sculpture, <laughs> but uh, he built the building uh, and um, yeah. Art Tower Mito, uh, this is nice. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, almost a, you know, an infinity column, but um, you know, thinking of Brancusi or Brancusi, but a little more twisted, uh, yet geometrical. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, a good, it's a good work. I don't know exactly what function it is. Uh, it it, uh, it uh, houses, it, uh, but it hosts. But it's an interesting, uh, it's sculpture, it's mostly sculpture, but uh, I, I think it has also a function inside. And it, it, I think it's, it's, it's not bad. 
so the problem with Arata Isozaki is that uh, sometimes it's difficult to know if a certain building was by him or not, unless you, you read about it, because he's, he's so versatile. Indeed, uh, um, uh, an eclectic, uh, uh, an eclecticist. And <laughs> it's difficult with an, with an eclecticist, but with a schizo-eclecticist, it's even more difficult. House of Mankind. Now, I don't know what this is. Let me see, House of Mankind. I, uh, I didn't look through this uh, um, PowerPoint presentation in uh, some time, during uh, uh, maybe two years. Uh, I wonder if, uh, yeah, he built it. This is it, the House of uh, Mankind. In, uh, why is it called so? In Galicia. Quite an ambitious name, the House of Mankind. What about the House of Woman, Womankind? Um, of course, mankind uh, refers to both men and, and, and women, but it's still... Uh, okay, the, this is the Tomus Museum of Mankind designed by Sozaki and built in, on an old quarry facing uh, in uh, La Coruña, Spain, 1993-1995. Now, a uh, palace in Barcelona, uh, probably a sports arena. Yes. There is a problem, I think, with him when, when, he, when the, the classical, so-called classical references are too obvious. Uh, I know he was obsessed almost by Palladio, and uh, it's not uh, the worst obsession one, one could have, but as opposed to Peter Eisenman, who was also obsessed by, uh, by, uh, by Palladio, but never allowed Palladio to enter, uh, uh, you know, uh, his work in at least in explicit ways at all. In the case of, uh, of Asoza Isozaki, is not so. Um, anyway, Barcelona. Uh, an international arts village, 1995-1998, uh, in, in Krakow. Uh, is this one? Uh, it's um, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm happy that uh, Isozaki also built in Poland. Maybe not one of his greatest buildings, but. Now, the Himalaya Center, we are approaching the end. This one, he entered the new phase in his work, and this was built like, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, something like this, uh, no more than 15 years ago. And yes, here we are dealing here with what a doctoral student uh, here amusingly named uh, the cave revival. Yes, there is, a, there is a cave revival in architecture these days. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> it's a very nice way to put it, yes. <laughs> the cave revival, yes. Uh, yeah, several important architects today work in this way. And of course, Isozaki, who was always in the front line, couldn't miss it. And uh, yes, you have his uh, rationalistic side, you have the cube, you have, but, but the main facade, uh, yeah, it's an invitation to contemplate. Uh, the new style, the cave revival. And you'll see also his latest buildings in Qatar, which is done kind of uh, in a similar way to this one. Uh, right, I mean, you cannot get, uh, you know, a cave revival more uh, convincing than this one. Well, the, the, the ceiling is not really, <laughs> so much in the, in the spirit of uh, cave revival, but, uh, or the floor, but otherwise it is. Well, Ginny Gang, a studio gang, built now the Museum of Natural History in New York also, very similar in terms of aesthetics with what we see here. I think architecture tries to renew itself, turning back beyond history in a way, or prior to history, to 
a history so uh, uh, or prehistory you know and yes inevitably we arrive at the cave i pre i personally prefer the cave than the um, you know the greek colonnade you know, the, the parthenon inspirations but here the schism the, of the schizo eclecticist is quite obvious no i mean it's incredible you know it's the same architect you know and he cannot even get rid of, of his uh, being tempted by uh, you know linguistic and graphic uh, insinuations of the culture of the place he, he builds in uh, what we see on the right so he is really juggling here with many balls with several balls uh, maybe this is also his 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 uh, power that is also you know potentially also his weakness Now, uh, and Anish Kapoor, uh, an important uh, Indian sculptor, uh, who actually I think he lives in the works in, in England now. Um, a very interesting piece that they did together. This only shows, you know, how versatile uh, um, really Isozaki is. You know, they give this inflatable thing that is, uh, I, I, I find it amazing. Um, maybe it's not so. Uh, complicated as it is for uh, for someone like me who doesn't know enough about this but uh, you know uh, we cannot uh, deny the the you know the the, the yes the even the, the beauty of 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 of, of this uh, the strange beauty of of what they created here and this is how it is deflated you know so this is what it is inflated and this is how it is deflated impeccably done you know and uh, anyway um, Now this is a pavilion in the desert in uh, in uh, in uh, Arizona. Um, he worked for a, I don't know an art dealer uh, and built a few very modest structures. They are not really buildings, and uh, for an art collector and uh, you know on, on his estate, it only shows that he can also accommodate in his work uh, works of a very small size and of a you know sculptural kind um, now those funny yellow things are not by isozaki but uh, anyway We are approaching the end. There is just one more work, uh, the latest that was built by him after this one. That is the client in the, <laughs> you know, uh, the first, you know, the, the one here. Anyway, it doesn't really matter, but this one. And we arrive, yes, at the last work that I will show tonight, the Qatar National Convention Center. I just have a few images. Uh, he is uh, repeating himself uh, more than a little bit uh, because we, we saw already the work in China. But this is what he did in Qatar. And, uh, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, it is Arata Isozaki. It is, uh, in a way, some kind of... Uh, you know, fragment of uh, the trunk of a tree that is also inflated. You know, it has this uh, 
uh, you know, what could be in a way more grotesque than an inflated trunk of a tree. But because of its giant size, it, it becomes, uh, um, you know, uh, some kind of a second reality or other reality that, that is uh, scenographic, is, uh, it is stage design, but, but then why not, you know? Uh, uh, plus we are dealing with a country that, uh, you know, welcomes, I guess, eccentricities. Uh, so this is uh, the eccentricity of uh, Varata Isozaki. You could say that maybe it's a representation of uh, some kind of nostalgia for the natural world. Everything else being so unnatural, you know, uh, the highways, the roads, the cars, <clears throat> everything else. It's also maybe also some kind of a, you know, uh, I don't know, giant uh, premonition maybe of, of some kind of, uh, I, I don't know if I'm not, I'm not maybe very uh, inspired now to, to explain what I feel, but I'm, 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 I'm asking myself, why, what made Isozaki uh, do this? You know, uh, the tree supporting uh, the roof, okay, uh, is not a tree house and the tree is not a tree, but, you know, the, the illustration is, um, cannot avoid uh, the reference to the tree. In fact, I expect uh, someone from the audience to help me with a more inspired uh, thoughts on this. If, if, you, if you have them. I don't know about more inspired thoughts, but I do wonder if in fact the tree is supporting the roof or if in fact it's- Probably uh, not. In some ways decorative. Uh, yeah, I mean, if it had to be uh, structural, it didn't have to be so emphatically. So, uh, you know, it's possible that, yes, they are rather decorative and that, uh, roof is just uh, nicely cantilevered and didn't mm. need the so-called trees. But this also could be seen as some kind of a statement itself, you know, about yes. the fake news of today, you know. It is in a way about fake news. Mm. I, I don't know if Arata Isozaki thought of in these terms, but It could also be a statement about uh, the kind of machine age represented by the flat, perfect uh, slab on top being supported by nature. Yeah, but it is a nature which appears to be more artificial than the flat. And the nature itself, yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, look at the human beings there, you know, they are like insects. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, their size, I mean, mm. this is huge, you know, you, you think you are in a Steven Spielberg movie. Yeah. And finally, you know, this is the last image in this presentation and is with the spider and I had problems with the spider. And I- Yes, I, your I, friend, how is he? Yes, I yeah. prepared this for the 23rd of July. Now mm. it's the 30th of July, exactly one, uh, one, uh, one week later. And I remember I intentionally ended with a, with a, with a, with a spider because I, I have my own theory about the spider and arachne uh, mm. the, the the goddess of uh, weaving uh, in for 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 Greece and and European world, and the sculpture was done by Louise Bourgeois, uh, the great uh, French sculptor sculptress, uh, who actually lived and worked a good the majority of her years in the United States. The the return of the spider now yes. The spider mm. uh, I think the spider uh, had uh, had. Uh, uh, you know, not, a, not the most beneficial effect on me, but I, with, with, with another occasion, maybe we'll talk about architecture and weaving, and maybe that will be on the 3rd of August, when will be the birthday of Antoine Picon, uh, who is concerned uh, with ornament in architecture, and if we talk about ornament and architecture, 
I feel like saying something about architecture and weaving. And if I say something about architecture and weaving, I will say something about arachne, because it's very, very interesting uh, um, her story. And my theory is that, and with this I will end, my theory is that, you know, fo uh, following the Greeks, we followed the anti-Arachne road. That's why the, the spider became kind of a fright creature. Uh, 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 many, many people are afraid of the spider, but I think this has uh, serious consequences uh, in our psychology. And, uh, and the spider represents uh, the road not taken. I, I cannot uh, engage myself now to explain more than I did. And in fact, I, I didn't explain. Uh, maybe I complicated myself on matters. Anyway, this is the last, uh, the last picture of the Arata Isozaki journey. Thank you very much. And uh, we did it again. <laughs> <laughs> we did it because, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasant uh, way to spend our time, uh, mm. you know, uh, not leaving architecture. Not well, you make it pleasant by putting in the effort. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mahadev. You are very generous. And uh, Andrei, how is it called that illness, arachnophobia, arachnephobia? Oh, I don't know. Um, well, you yeah, wrote to me about of spiders, arachnophobia. Pardon? Yeah, no. arachnophobia is the yeah. fear of spiders, yeah. Right, <laughs> right. Um, anyway, we'll talk about the spiders more uh, very soon. Mm. So I think it was a good day. David uh, sh showed us uh, an extensive uh, body of work uh, by uh, a Portuguese architect whose name I, I still have troubles to pronounce. And that's why I find alternate ways to go around it without naming him. <laughs> I don't know why I have this difficulty with his name. And tomorrow, I don't know if we are to, to meet tomorrow. Uh, there is this, um, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, but, but if we don't meet tomorrow, we'll have a pause until the 3rd of August, of, of August yes, when there will mm. be architecture and ornament by the way of uh, Antoine Picon's uh, birthday. Antoine Picon, who asked me to remove him from the list of contacts, but I, I, I'm going to prepare myself very well to prove him wrong. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, so goodbye. Thank, uh, have a good, uh, have a good rest of your days. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. bye. Daliana, uh, Florian, Florian left, but Daliana is still here. Yeah, Florian is in front of me, but he is very tired. And uh, I am going soon. This is a uh, one twenty-two a.m. And uh, this is really heavy stuff, heavy material from Eduardo Soto de Moura with and Arata Izozaki. It's a uh, um, it's very um, interesting. Thank you very much, but also very heavy on on the head. Okay, we'll talk later. Okay, thank you for showing thank up. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Now, Andre, Andre, uh, Vatsal, uh, Alexandra, and David, uh, do you want to say goodbye, good night, good, good whatever, or should we uh, end? Well, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Yeah, well, uh, you are always generous, but. Uh, you know, it was like an introduction, you know, to, to, to an architect who, with all his weaknesses, uh, deserves a little bit of attention, I think. Okay. I recently saw a short clip with uh, uh, Arata Isozaki talking about Palladio. So indeed he had an interest in him and uh, he, so he said that he found it curious that in that, um, in one of the, uh, the buildings you showed us, the one uh, which was quite classical with that classical entrance with the two columns and the arch. And he said that he found a great resemblance with uh, a Palladian mo motif and, uh, in that and without knowing about uh, it. And he thought uh, which was the reason um, why both of them, Palladio and him, did the same, uh, uh, proposed similar forms or a similar entrance. 
Well, you know, to be honest with you, what I know about Isozaki is that uh, I, I, I don't think he's always so innocent. Uh, I, it's hard for me to believe that he didn't know about a certain building by Palladio if I understood 